for lunch where the grad students we're still on the campus of the university of california irvine where along with her students elizabeth loftus has invited me to a picnic it's good well, oh this looks very good yeah well, have a seat okay it's an appetizing spread but among the choices one leaps out at me immediately deviled eggs they're in the deviled eggs now, to understand why I'm so taken with those eggs, we have to go back a couple of weeks. Can you pass a plate, Alan, please? Good. Okay, great. Mmm, hate watermelon. Elizabeth had sent me a long questionnaire about the foods I like or dislike. Well, see. Another questionnaire was about things that may or may not have happened to me as a child. I ate two scoops of ice cream and one cone. That, that definitely did happen. Of course it happened. Sold chocolate bars for a fundraiser. Definitely did not happen. Ate freshly pickled vegetables. No. I'm, as you can imagine, fascinated to know what the questionnaire was really about. I mean, was it a, wasn't it about food, was it? Well, it actually, um, we have a very sophisticated computer program that can take all of that information that you gave us about your childhood, about your, you know, your likes, your dislikes, your habits, your personality, yeah. we have fed it into a computer. Right. And, and you can tell my shoe size from that. My obvious skepticism here stems from knowing that Elizabeth is an expert on false memories, things we think we remember, but that never really happened. This is the profile from this very, very sophisticated computer program. And so I'd just like you to take a look at it, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions about it. Let's see. You disliked spinach as a young child. You enjoyed fried foods. You felt sick after eating hard-boiled eggs. Eating chocolate birthday cake made you happy. I can't remember any time when I ate chocolate birthday cake and actually got happy from it. All right, well, let, let me just pick one of the other ones. Okay. You felt uh, sick after eating hard-boiled eggs. Just no. when... No, no, I can say with almost... Uh, certain, I can't be certain, you can't be certain about anything that happened that long ago, but uh, I'm pretty sure that I never got sick after eating hard-boiled eggs. I can't remember a time when that might have happened. Well, the, the, the thing about our childhood is that because it's so long ago and because yeah. there is forgetting and because there is childhood amnesia and there are all kinds of things going on we often don't remember things that are true of us right. i mean you you'd accept that wouldn't you uh, yes okay yes. Yeah. sometimes when you try to imagine um, what what might have happened it will tap into some of those forgotten experiences mm -hmm. so that's why i was asking you to try to think about when you might have eaten chocolate cake or when you might have eaten too many hard-boiled eggs and not felt that great about it. Yeah. Can't remember a time when I might have eaten hard-boiled eggs and gotten sick from it. I, um, don't remember eating many hard-boiled eggs as a kid, either. Water high. A few minutes later, I'm again filling out the questionnaire about my childhood experiences with food. Ate a hot dog with onions and sauerkraut. No. Ate a candy apple at a state fair. No. Got sick after eating too many hard-boiled eggs. No, but I can't be definitely sure. Say it too. Had a cheese pizza delivered. No. Tell me the truth. You don't even have a computer, do you? We we <laughs> we do. We, you saw some of our better computers in there. Yeah. But we do. I bet that's a trick. What do you suppose that is? Well, of course there's a trick. Elizabeth was trying to persuade me I remembered something that hadn't happened. Oh, really? Okay, Alan. Yeah. Here, here was the study. A few weeks ago, we, we asked you about your childhood experiences and asked you if you ever uh, felt uh, ill eating hard-boiled eggs, and you said one definitely didn't happen. Right. Then we gave you feedback from a computer mm -hmm. in which which of course was bogus right. and i know you maybe suspected that but it was it was bogus but in the middle of that feedback was the from the very smart computer we suggested that you as a child had uh, gotten sick eaten, eating hard-boiled eggs and uh, later when we asked you to fill out uh, the sheet about your childhood again you increased your confidence. You gave it a two this time instead of a one, I believe. But, and so you did show an effect that we're showing in this study, that w increased confidence that you had the experience that was suggested to you 
but, but, but was completely made up by us. Now, the last step in this process is to see whether the, the manipulation has any further consequences down the road. I mean, will you avoid hard-boiled eggs? <laughs> I'm just not that interested in hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> well, people make up all kinds of rationalizations for their behavior. I mean... <laughs> By claiming that a smart computer had insights into their childhood, Elizabeth Loftus has managed to persuade many of the subjects in her study to change their opinion about what foods they like or dislike. In other words, not only is it frighteningly easy to implant false memories in people, you can then get them to change what they think and maybe even how they behave based on those false memories. It's more than potato chips that, that uh, is at the heart of this somehow, right? I mean, the, I mean the, you, a lot of your work has to do with false memories and court cases. Right. A little tiny false memories, um, maybe, that we probably have all the time don't um, hurt people very much. But when it comes to people developing these very big false memories of being uh, molested in satanic rituals or uh, assaulted by people who didn't do anything to them and we know that false memories of this sort have been generated then it does people a lot of harm it, it wrong people get prosecuted uh, innocent people get sued civilly uh, and so the false memory problem is a very big problem in society and we're here really just trying to understand how it is that you can plant a seed of suggestion and out of this a whole false memory can grow. Well, I intend to nip one false memory in the bud right now. Give me that egg. But I don't eat the yolks. Mm, that's good. Well, We've uh, planted false memories uh, probably in the minds of 25,000 subjects over the course of 30 years. Uh, this latest work that is actually kind of inspired by the whole repressed memory controversy that I lived through for the last 10 years is part of an effort, uh, uh, not only on my part, but others who work in this field to plant really rich, big false memories such as the ones that I mentioned to you, that you were a uh, victim of a vicious animal attack or a serious indoor or outdoor accident. And here we're looking at um, whether those false memories have repercussions, have affect subsequent thoughts, intentions, and behaviors down the road. Uh, and so you can take people who will deny having an experience uh, to begin with when they enter the study, you subject them to the manipulation, Later on, they will tell you they actually do have either a belief that this is true of them or a memory. That means it has sensory detail attached to, to it, and it feels like a real recollection. Uh, and, and so I, I guess I throw this out to you. Is there some possibility that this kind of approach to the problem of, uh, of changing what people think and, and maybe correcting some of those dangerous beliefs uh, is, is something that we ought to be looking into uh, for purposes of the, of the concerns that have uh, brought us, many of us here today. So thank you for uh, listening and Alan for helping me.